I didn't want to turn the whole thing into like a, a nostalgic conversation about Brighton, but it turns out we're both from Brighton, and I wanted to talk yeah. to you a little bit about that, about that, about growing up in Brighton, in what was actually, it's funny Brighton, for people who don't know that, well, people think it's a certain kind of place, and it's actually not. Brighton's got a bit rough around the edges. Brighton, yeah. it's, it's always been, it's a working-class seaside town, right? Yeah, it is. We certainly was when I was growing up, which was a bit before you. Um, no, only a little bit. No, it's quite a bit, actually. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm just working it well, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, it was really. It was a bit rough around the edges. And I think that's probably why I kept thinking, oh, why don't I go back and live there? You know, it's such a... There's lots to do. It's creative. There's all of that stuff. And it's much nicer now, I think, than it was then. But I, something quite can't get me back there. Um, I think it's because I left, really, when I was 16 and I started going on the train every day to stage school. And... Um, uh, and my life became about that, really, with Peter Duncan, who's here now. Where is he? There you go, my okay. first boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> and we're still friends. <laughs> so once I met him, I, that was it. Brighton was done. <laughs> Let me, I don't blame you. I've made the same life choice. Don't live, don't live in Brighton. But I want to rewind a little bit and sort of capture you at that moment, which is deciding that you know, a life on stage or a life of creativity is the life you want to pursue. Because it seems like you, you came to that decision early and you were like very steadfast about it. Well, it wasn't that clear-cut, actually, because the truth is, without elongating it too much, I, I was a singer, and I was a really good classical singer. So um, I suppose if I did what I was um, uh, born to do, I, I would be an opera singer. I, I, was, I was that good. Um, but nobody ever took me to the opera, so I did all these festivals, and, it was all, and I had pro professional training and all of that. But nobody ever took me, which was ridiculous, because Glyndebourne was up the road. So I just worked out in my 15-year-old brain that opera was boring, based on nothing, on no knowledge of it. And, I mean, all these decisions I made myself. I mean, my parents were wonderful people uh, and so um, uh, supportive of me and everything, but they didn't really know anything about it. And they didn't really say, hang on a minute, do you think you should be doing, should you be stopping your... O levels as they were then, uh, and going off to stage school. And but I just kind of, I sort of sorted it all out myself. Um, and I thought, right, I don't want to do opera, but perhaps I'll do musicals. Musical theatre will be where I find myself. So my my dad did all the applications, and I mean, one of the things that was a huge help in it all because we couldn't have afforded it otherwise. I got a hundred percent grant. Uh, my train fare was paid. So uh, it cost me nothing. My dad used to give me a pound a day for my lunch, and that lasted two days, really. Could do two lunches and a piece of toast and a cup of tea on the Brighton Bell. <laughs> um, and that was it. So, uh, but while I was there, um, I, I got uh, quite interested in acting. There was a very good acting teacher who I'm still in contact with now, um, who's actually gone back to Italia Conti to be the head of drama. Um, and I got sort of interested in it, and crucially, I suppose, she, we, she used to do um, improvisations. And at 16, I started doing these improvisations. I thought, oh, I quite, like, I quite like this. Cut to, you know, eight years later, and I'm sitting there with Mike Lee, and uh, it really took off. So it wasn't, a, I wasn't clear cut. I sort of thought, right, I know I want to do it somehow or other, but I don't want to sing, really. And, but I did do singing. I did pantomime. I did, my first proper job was a musical in the West End that, oddly enough, John Schlesinger directed. Um, and then it just went from there, and then I did a bit of presenting. I did everything, and I sort of did it without any knowledge of where it was going. And I certainly had not tapped into the acting thing of being chameleon and playing something that wasn't me. That's fascinating because it's often, I mean, every actor is different, but often when you speak to actors, they have this one great epiphany, this eureka moment where they like, fall in love with the stage and that's, and that's what they will be forevermore. And it doesn't sound like you had quite that light bulb moment in quite that way. It was all a bit more yeah. open-ended. It was, it was. And, and really from, I, I mean, I spent about nine months at Italia Conti Stage School. They were my agent. They got me jobs. So at 16, I started working. I said yes to everything. So I was doing such a mishmash of things, some bits of singing, presenting, bit of acting, all over the place, without any, just having a lovely time. I didn't really 
analyze it. I wasn't, didn't intellectualize it. I didn't really know where it was going. And then at 22, I met Mike Lee. And, and it, that, that was a moment, really, because, because of, um, A, I could do it. And um, I, lo I loved it. And I was an unlikely candidate for him because I was a bit sort of, um, when I first met him and had a, had a, you have a long session with him. Um, he, and he kind of was constantly saying, you know, we're going to do a bit, you're going to get into character and be this character, but you just have to sort of be them and it's not about showing off or anything. But of course, I'd come from a stage school. So I thought, no, I've got to make this interesting, you know. So I was kind of jazz hands <laughs> all over the place. <laughs> and uh, so he, uh, he very reluctantly took me on. Um, and, but actually, when we started doing it properly, it was, um, it was a kind of light, that was my light bulb moment. And right. also, he was the first person to say to me that I was good at it. Well, I was wondering, actually, because, I mean, one of the themes of the day is that I think a lot of the time it's difficult for people to feel confident in themselves. You know, people do. But if you don't, if you don't have money or connections, you sometimes feel there's an imposter syndrome which creeps in there. Mm. And it's interesting that only at that, so you were already in working with Mike Lee. You'd already done, you got that far. And it's only then that you start feeling confident. Yes. Yeah, I think I'd been confident up till then. I think, that I, I, I think my 16 to 22 years were quite confident. It was after that when I started getting involved in this different type of work. You know, after I did the first film that Phil Davis, who's on next uh, this afternoon, we did a film called Grown Ups, which was when Mike still made films for the BBC. Um, that, that, that went out, and I was still only, I don't know, 22, 23. Um, that went out, and it was... It was, um, that opened up so many other doors. And I then started working at the Royal Court. Um, and that lasted for about 12 years. I was there doing plays off and on. And, and that's when the insecurity set in. Because I was working with Max Stafford Clark, Carol Churchill, Edward Bond. And I used to think, Christ almighty, what, what do I know? I hadn't been to university. Um, I, I was probably university. Um, a university candidate, but I'd not pursued it in any way. So it was then that I started to feel that I didn't know what I was talking about and that I didn't have anything to offer. And there was, a mo there was another light bulb moment when, when we were working on a play called Serious Money, which is a Carol Churchill play. And we'd done a month of um, research and we'd, all the actors would go out and meet people involved in the world of Serious Money, which was the financial world. And we'd bring all these characters back to the rehearsal room, do them, and Carol would go away and eventually write a play. And when, when she did eventually write the play, I, oddly enough, given that she's a feminist and um, does write very well for women, I felt she'd underwritten um, the part for me. And um, so I went to Max and I said, I, I just don't think this is quite there, really. And he said, well, you must go and tell her. I said, I can't tell Carol Churchill that you know, she's underwritten it and that she's missed things and I bought all this stuff to the room and she's not used it, why? Um, you know, I'm not happy. Um, and he said, well, you can because you, what you have to offer is what she can't do and what she has to offer you can't do. And you've got to value that and understand that your gifts as an actress are what we want and your voice about... <laughs> Your, op your opinions about what she's written, having workshopped it, are valid. So that was another kind of, you know, the chip on my shoulder about not going to university and not really having any um, even further education. I truncated it all at 15. Um, sort of went in an instant. Fascinating. All right, I want to bring in a clip because we've talked a little bit about, about Leslie's phenomenal gift as an, as an actor. Let's have a look at some of them. This is from High Hopes, which is one of the early <laughs> films. One of the early films you worked with, Mike. <laughs> Perfect setup. Um, let's have a look at the cliff and then pick up the conversation. Are there any names you know? That was Letitia in High Hopes, wasn't it? Letitia Booth Brain. Perfect name. I mean, you talked a little bit, and, people, and actors do talk about working with Mike Lee and about the improvisations that they bring. So I wonder how much of Letitia was you, and it was she was your creation. Oh, loads of it's you. I mean. Um, uh, <laughs> I mean, he's, he's the only one that has this overall knowledge of what the film is going to be about and where, it, where it's going to go and the themes of it and the emotion, emotions that it's going to deal with. 
Um, but so you work very much in isolation um, with him creating this character. Um, but it was quite tricky doing this because David Bamber, who played my husband in it, um, the big thing was get, was trying to get into our heads that you know, to people like Letitia, nothing's a problem. You know that everything's fine. You know because we we I was doing a lot of, well overacting probably but just you know everything was a problem and he goes no nothing's a problem because money or social so it was quite it was quite a leap we, I remember David and I went to Harrods one day um, in character I mean this film was made in <laughs> 1989 oh you do a lot of that we once lost Mike Lee in the reptile house of London Zoo <laughs> Phil and I did doing an <laughs> improvisation um, and then we found him again by the elephants or something <laughs> Um, what was I saying? Uh, you were talking about building Letitia as a character. Oh, yes, yeah. So there, there was, yeah, we spent the day in Harrods, and um, I mean, this was 1987, something like that. And it was uh, unbelievable, this day we spent. I mean, it, I think it's when Harrods was a bit less touristy than it is now. It was just full of incredibly over-the-top aristocrats shopping and it, it made it kind of that was sort of all right okay we're all right because they are actually like that uh, no i was <laughs> honestly for, for younger people in the audience i mean that's it's a bit of a time capsule high hopes because you remember because the 80s was that moment it was like the thatcher 80s and now i mean if we can speak frankly people from a certain kind of background a very aristocratic background they tend to play it down Absolutely. at that point it was all front and center wasn't well, it? well that's what that relationship was about because um, that was meant to be a house in uh, Islington. We actually shot it in Bow, but it was meant to be Islington. And it was about the gentrification of houses that had been council houses that were being bought up by, um, you know, the aristocratic people, po oh, yuppies, which was the term that was used for, you know, young up and coming something or others, wasn't it? Young professionals. Thank you. Very good, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the other thing I wanted to ask about Mike Lee was particularly is Mike. I've, I've read Mike Lee quoted like a dozen different times saying when people ask him how he works, and people always ask him how he works, he says, "Ask Leslie." So you've become <laughs> this kind of. I mean, how does that, is, is that does that surprise you? Do you think that he says, "Ask Leslie"? Yeah, and that you're he's you're like his representative on Earth. You're supposed to you know, <laughs> you, you know the secrets. Well, I've worked with him more than anybody else, but I I suppose uh, you find out by doing all the junkets I've done with him over the years and things like events like this that you 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 talk about it um, and I suppose I talk about it quite frankly and honestly and um, so it's be, it's it's become that um, but listen if we just talk about Mike today we could be here till midnight oh, we're not going to don't worry we're just going to stop talking about Mike <laughs> I mean I wanted no because it's a celebration of you so I want to I kind of want to reel through some of these clips and get you to talk about each of these films mm. and I think that's why we're going to do this so no we're going to stop talking about Mike Lee no I we don't have to but what I'm saying I is want to talk about you not, not Mike Lee oh, okay, yeah, um, much better idea yeah <laughs> I want to move things on because I was just going to actually move it on to The Firm which is a film you made just after High oh Hopes. god yes very different kind of film very different kind of character I don't yes. know maybe we should look at the clip and then talk about it afterwards yep now you said I bet I don't know which clip they're going to play actually it wasn't you, oh, was, I, it, was it a different clip yeah okay. they usually show the one where we're um, we um Oh, you're having a row on the set. If you haven't seen The Firm, I mean, The Firm is an amazing film anyway. Leslie is. Des Leslie's a real star of The Firm, and there's a particular scene <laughs> in that, which is, yeah, you and Gary Oldman having this Barney. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, The Firm's this, it feels like a film where you're pretty much the only woman in the film, but it feels like yes. that's, that role is so pivotal and so central, and actually it's not, it's kind of not about the blokes, because the blokes are boys, yes. and you're having to be, yeah. you're having to be a grown-up. Is that how it felt making it? Yeah, it did. I mean, Alan Clark, who, um, who, who, who directed it, the late Alan Clark. Um, he, 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 we shot it all in, on Steadicam, I mean, completely on Steadicam, which is quite unusual. So there was an enormous freedom with it. Um, uh, and Gary and I were married. In fact, I was pregnant at the time, but we made that, but we didn't tell Alan because we were worried that he might worry, you know. But, um, so we, we, we'd acted a lot together, so we were, we were very comfortable with it, and Alan just let us do our, do our own thing quite a lot of the time. Um, and it was, uh, it was really quite extraordinary. You did, we did, I did feel, Gary did feel, that we were, we were sort of doing this, this new type of filmmaking. You know, it felt like we were 
breaking some sort of boundaries, and certainly for the BBC. And I remember it took an age for it to go out, um, and Alan kept ringing us and saying, um, oh, there's a problem with this, problem with that, censorship. And in the end, I had... <coughs> Uh, that I said fuck eight times, and the BBC decided that I could say it seven times <laughs> and not eight, which was a real shame because uh, we shot it so much on Steadicam, and it's harder to edit on Steadicam. You sort of have to go with the flow of, of, the, of the shooting. Um, there's, a, there's the big, big argument we have uh, where, where he runs downstairs, he runs out the front door, and I'm kicking the front door, and he's going whatever he's doing and I and I end and the scene ends with me going one last fuck off and Alan was ringing to say I'm really sorry I'm going to have to end the scene on Gary outside because that we cannot have that fuck off <laughs> and all the boys were saying fuck and every but, but it, it was at the time unbelievably it was about a woman saying fuck off oh, that's interesting I mean isn't that unbelievable but it was and also there was a big scene that we shot where he comes back from a game and he's all cooked up and fired up and she's been up waiting for him and he comes home and um, they fight and they have sex on the living room floor and she it looks like he's raping her because she's not wanting to and then she starts laughing hysterically and hitting him back um, and it's their game, you know, it's their sort of sexual game that they, he, you know, she likes it that he, he, she, he pretends to rape her. And, uh, you know, obviously that scene had to go as well. But I used to do Q&As where universities would show that scene f for discussion, you know. Um, so there was a lot that went, but it was, yeah, it was ridiculous. It took ages for the censorship on it was... And there was some really, I mean, Phil Davis, who's here, there was not some really nasty scenes with him gouging people's eyes out. And I mean, it was ghastly. But, you know, it was, it was, it was a film that really was at the beginning of the crest of a, a crest of a wave. I mean, I wonder, we're here talking about class, but I wonder how much you feel as, as a female working class actor, someone from a working class background, how different your experience was from male actors. You know, that idea, the working class hero, Historically, it's like it's Albert Finney and it's Sean Connery and it's Michael Caine. I and mean, do you feel that, like, as a working class woman, that there were, there were different pressures on you? Yeah, I, I mean, I certainly feel that um, it it's taken a long time for my time to come, and I think that that's a lot. That's a lot to do with the fact that when I was in my twenties and thirties, things were predominantly about men, and I was, um, you know, practically everybody I had relationships with was playing leads, and I sort of wasn't. And um, uh, it's taken a long time for the tide to turn. And, and I remember when Helen Mirren did um, Prime Suspect, which is a series that went out, I think, in the sort of, uh, first of all, in the early 80s. That was really extraordinary because you had a woman not just playing uh, a, a detective, but a series that was fronted by a woman. And that was a turning point. Do you think some of that, obviously you can't generalise, I mean, every actor is different, every person is different, but do you think some of that is about attitude? And it's about, but the reason I say that is because one of the things that always stayed with me reading an interview with you was the interviewer saying, I've never seen someone, I think a glass got broken during the interview, and apparently your first impulse was just to basically make sure that the person cleaning it up didn't have broken glass on their hands. I was saying, I've never seen, like, you know, a TV film star take such care over, like, the, the person who cleans. And sometimes maybe to be the star, you have to be selfish in a way that maybe it's easier for a man to be selfish in that way than it is for a woman, do you think? There were certainly a lot of selfish men that I had relationships. Not you, Peter, don't worry. <laughs> um, you know, where, where it was all about their ego. And, and, and I think that it took me a very long time to, to realise that, um, uh, you know, I, I, I needed some things in terms of my work to be about me. Um, and in a way, I got, I got that with Mike. But I didn't, wasn't getting it in other areas of work. Um, you know, he, uh, Mike, Mike has such a repertoire of actors, and sometimes you go in and do a cameo in a film with him, and sometimes you go in and you do a, a, a leading role, um, and that's great because I, I, I always, I, I've never said no to working with Mike because you know that you're going to be on an adventure and you're going to do something completely different to what you've done before, um, and he does have, you know, like in. 
Vera Drake, I do a cameo. And in another year, Imelda Staunton does a cameo. You know, and I think it's great that you get really good actors who are happy to come in and do you know, a few days filming. It's, it's really good. But no, I think it took, I, it took a long time for me to realize uh, that, that, that I had a right to be um, a, a leading actor. It's weird that, isn't it? But I think that's partly to do with, um, with, with how I was, was brought up. You know, my, my mother didn't work and she brought up three daughters, but she, you know, she cooked. My dad never cooked. My mum was the one who did all the housework. I, I grew up, and she wasn't a feminist. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't really shown that there could be another way or shown uh, that, that, that I could have a, a voice that was more important than a man's voice. So it t takes a long time, it did, it did for me, it took a long, because I wasn't an anarchist in any way, I was never the naughty girl at school, ever. So I didn't have a kind of rebellious streak, but I have now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's probably worth saying as well, when you were building up this extraordinary body of work, you're bringing up a kid as well. You know, you're, you're a single mum at that point, you know, so you're working and you're bringing up a child, and that's quite a juggling act to do for anyone, no matter what the job is, but particularly for an actor, yes. because of the nature of it, things, are, things happen at short notice, you have to, you know, you're expected to be able to travel, to go to wherever to make the film. Yes, except, uh, I mean, I didn't travel for, for, ver for those reasons sometimes and jobs that I wanted to do. I mean, I remember I wanted to do Kate in Taming of the Shrew, for the RSC, and it was going to be in Stratford for a bit, and I thought, all right, Stratford, I could cope with. But then it was going to be 17 weeks touring, and I had a five-year-old, you know. So there were things I couldn't do. And, um, but um, the thing is, I can't really go down a road of saying, oh, it was so hard, and aren't I a martyr, and wasn't I great? Because the truth is, I just got on with it, and I think it's why now I can multitask, and um, I, I, I've got. It, it, incredible stamina. I mean, I've just been doing Long Day's Journey in tonight at Wyndham's for 10 weeks, and at the same time shooting a series. So Jeremy Irons coming in and saying he was tired. <laughs> <laughs> My reply was, yes, Jeremy, you've got a wife, you've got a PA, you've got, uh, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> That's very polite of you, actually, <laughs> under the circumstances. <laughs> we promised not to let Mike Lee dominate the conversation, but another, another clip I wanted to show is from the film Another Year, which is oh, yeah. a more recent Mike Lee film. But yes. let, again, let's play the clip and then have a chat. Yeah. I mean, if you'll forgive us sort of a question from a non-actor, it's interesting because so much of the work you've done is on stage, and yet I look at that on the big screen, and there is such incredible nuance there on your face. And I just wonder, how can you balance those two things? Because, I mean, it feels like the stage would be a different, a slightly different discipline, because it's less about the face. And you're, but just what's happening there is kind of extraordinary. Well, it is. I mean, I think they're completely different disciplines um, and require different things. And... Um, I, I, I know that if I don't do a play for a while, I feel really bad, because I, I, I think it's, um, I mean, of course, the, the skill of that is that you have to do that, and you might do it 10, 15 times, and you've got to repeat it, and all of those things. But I do think, I think acting on stage is the ultimate test, really, because nobody's going to stop you. Nobody's going to edit you and make you look better than perhaps you were, and... It's your, it's your response. It's a control thing in a way. It's your responsibility. The night begins and ends with you and the other actors, and you, you've, you've got to, you've got to get it right. And you know, you can't, you can't phone it in. It, I, 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 yeah. I mean, but it doesn't mean you don't do all of that detail. I mean, if you're not, as long as you're not playing the O2, you know, you can. People can see what you're doing. They can, they can see the pain on your face or the, you know, emotion going. It, so. It, it's just, I think, the characterizations and the performances are the same. It's just that you shift it to be, obviously, a bit louder on stage and all of that. And, um, and sometimes on film, you, you're aware of the fact that, you know, it is a big close-up and maybe something that would be a, a bigger gesture could be smaller or whatever. I mean, the other thing I wanted to mention about another year was, I mean, I felt, I remember banging on about this at the time, that that was a performance that was deserving of an Oscar nomination back then. I just wondered, you know, having worked with Mike Lee so much, is there a sense that, it's not really his fault, but that the actors 
in his films. They give these incredible performances, but it's kind of overshadowed because people think of it as a Mike Lee film, so they sort of think that he's sort of responsible for it, and that feels a little bit like that's you. In fact, that's not really Mike Lee. Yeah, and the, you know, and the truth is, you know, because you 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 do you, you when you when you shoot it. You absolutely know what you're saying. There is, there is a script, although the actors never have it written down. We have to sort of memorise it, it without the script. But you say the same things every take. It's, you're not improvising on camera, which is a sort of thing that people get wrong. They think we're making it up and just rolling the camera and seeing what happens, and it's, it's not remotely like that. Um, so we know what we're saying, but it, that, it, in a way, it's just that you, you, a scriptwriter might say, if a scriptwriter said to you, it took them 18 months to write a script, you'd think, oh, that's, well, okay. If they said five years to write a script, you'd think, oh, that's a long time, but hey. But when we start with Mike, although he has themes and notions in his head, um, all we're doing really is creating an end result that is, that is a script at the end of the day. It's just been arrived at through a different route, and that route is him collaborating with actors and creating characters um, um, but all the words that I've said in that are, are my words you know I've I've created that that scene that sentence that he then edits you know says right don't say that then say it then skip that bit and the, you know he's he's masterminding all that but but actually the the verbal diarrhea that I will have as a character comes from my head and my creation of the character. You should have a writer's credit then, right? Don't get me started. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> might be a good time to introduce another clip. Um, I wanted to talk about Mum and about TV as a sort of separate form. I mean, Mum has arrived, and it's this, and it's this beautiful, warm-hearted, phenomenal success. Um, so I want to talk to you about that and about t working in TV generally. But let's look at, uh, look, yeah, take a look at a couple of quick clips from Mum. And again, there's this amazing kind of nuance and this amazing sort of sophistication about what's going on there. And yet, from the outside, what people say about TV is that even now, it's kind of a grind actually making it. And actually, just, you know, there, there's a lot of pressure to just get the thing done. Um, and it doesn't feel like, again, as a non actor, it doesn't feel like that would be the ideal situation, the ideal circumstance to deliver work of that sort of sophistication. But you're doing it. Somehow you're doing it. That, I mean, that is, the, that is the big issue with television, is the time you, that you don't have. You just have to. You, but you have to be very, very, very prepared. You have to really do your work at home. And, um, but, you know, I'm, 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 um, I'm very careful with television about what I do and what I don't, what I don't do. And I, I mean, the writing of that is so supreme. Uh, Stefan Goloszewski writes it. Um, and the first series was directed by Richard Laxton, and the second series was that's just finished um, airing was directed by Stefan, the writer. But you know, it's it's um, you're halfway there, really. It, so, and and Kathy, the character, you know, it, it, in a way, it's kind of it's kind of um, an easy part to play because um, they've always said that Kathy is the audience. What, what she's thinking about what another character says or how ridiculous another character is or how whatever, uh, that's what the audience is thinking. So in a way, I just have to listen on that show. And as long as the camera's watching me listen, it's kind of done for me. But, uh, but, but there is an enormous pressure on television to, to move fast and... Um, you know, I've 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 worked with some actors who are ostensibly film actors who come into television, and they just don't quite realise how how lickety spit you need to be, and you do have to learn the lines, and you have to come in really, really, really prepared. But then the other thing I really enjoy about it is 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 exactly that that in you know it's seven thirty in the morning, the crew's going to arrive at eight and you're already ready and that and you're in costume and you're done and you've got to work out how to shoot what the, or how to do this three page scene and i love the kind of right let's knock this out of the park you know i i like that which is very different from the kind of ease with which you go into a five six week rehearsal for a play so i i just like that i love it and i'm, I'm very 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 uh, grateful that 
I'm jumping around from all three things. Well, I was going to say the other the other half, I suppose, of this incredible idea that you've had is Phantom Thread, the Paul Thomas Anderson film, which feels yes. like, um, you know, there's probably overlaps there, but it feels in some ways a very different project from Mum. Um, I mean, tell us a little bit about the, about the first, you know, the day the script arrived and, and, and the moment that this idea came into your life. Well, I mean, it, 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 it came on... Um, the number six has always been sort of relevant in my life, and I only realised that quite, quite recently, that most of the houses I'd lived in and lived in them had a six. My son was born on the six. There's six has cropped up all along. And it was only when I looked at the script that Paul sent me that it was the six of the six, 16. Anyway. Um, <laughs> I mean, the truth is, nothing... I wasn't sitting around. I, I, I was so happy. Everything was fine. Everything was going good. The career was great. I'd never really thought about, uh, you know, America because I thought, well, I'm certainly not going to go over there and do pilot season. I'm not going to whore myself over there because they don't really know me, except they do a bit from Mike Lee's. But you're, you're kind of going, please employ me. And I'm not going to do that. I, you know, I, not because I'm grand or anything like that. It would just not make me happy as a person. So I, I just kind of never really regarded it as something that would be in my life. But my agent rang me and she said, um, I was doing a bit of cleaning, actually. Uh, she, she, Paul, she said, Paul Thomas Anderson wants to ring you tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock. I went, oh, OK. Um, she said, I asked him if it could be a conference call, but he said, no, he just wants to talk to you. Um, she said, I can't tell you anything about it. I said, yeah, he won't call. Or if he does, it'll be three o'clock, you know, when he remembers. So 11 o'clock on the dot, he calls. Um, and, uh, I mean, we instantly got on. And he said, look, I've got a script. Um, I'm not going to email it because I'm, I don't, he does, gets frightened about things being found. So he said, I'm going to DHL it so it'll be a few days. He said, have a read and give us a call when you've got a minute. <laughs> Oh, yeah, when I've got, like, I'm not going to read it immediately, you know. <laughs> he said it's quite sparsely written, which is true. He doesn't really put stage directions or anything. So it's kind of just the dialogue. And um, so I, I, I rang him back a few days later, and we talked, and he said Daniel was going to be doing it. Um, we'd be playing brother and sister. Um, and... Uh, so that was that, and it was a Friday. So he said, look, I'm coming over in a couple of months, so let's meet. And um, uh, so I said, fine. So my agent said, what does he say? What does he say? I said, well, he's coming over in a couple of months. She said, well, has he asked you to do it? I said, well, not in so many words, but <laughs> this was Friday. So anyway, on the Sunday, he um, emailed me. He rang me again, and he said, look, I'm really sorry. I realized that I didn't say to you that it's yours if you want it, <laughs> and that you might be having a horrible weekend. So um, it's yours. So that was that. So it couldn't have been easier. If you'd have said to me, how will you get to be in either an American movie that's, you know, Hollywood-backed or Paul Thomas Anderson or anybody, I'd have said, well, you know, 25 auditions, ghastly self-taping, all of that, going through the ropes and then not getting it, probably. But so it couldn't have been easier. It was yours. It was yours. And I think anyone who's seen the film will know it's yours. We're going to look at a clip from Phantom Thread. We're also going to look at a, a, a quick clip of Paul Thomas Anderson talking about you and Phantom Thread afterwards as well. Oh, no. I'm afraid so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't seen Phantom Thread and Leslie Manville in Phantom Thread, go and see it, for God's sake. Um, you got the Oscar nomination at that point. I mean, I think you should have had one before, as I say. But you got it then. How much difference does that make? Oh, instant, overnight. It's like they... Um, it's like you've, you, it, Hollywood thinks they've just discovered some, you know, bright new star, and you just go, nah, I've been around a bit, you know. But going to the Oscars, you know, that, which is a, another experience to, for another time, but the big surprise was that everybody knew me. And, and I, you, you, I, I, you, I just didn't expect that for a minute. I mean, I know they've all seen the film, but you, I just didn't expect it, that people that I was kind of going, there's Steven Spielberg. And he comes out and goes, hi, Leslie. I think you're great in the film. And he went, Woo! Which is ridiculous. I know, I know I shouldn't be behaving like that, but it was a bit of a... That, when you say, what's the difference, that's the difference, and then suddenly you just get offered films. But I wonder, in terms of being surprised, I wondered, did you know... So that scene that we've just seen, for instance, did you know, your experienced actor, do you think, OK, yeah, I've nailed that? 
No. Right. And I suppose also because there's always that, that fear with an actor, it feels like, which is you never quite know, because you never know what cut the, the, the director's going to use. You don't know no, what and Paul there, shoots a lot. I mean, a lot. And he, he doesn't really get cooking until you start shooting. So the preparation is all in, you know, the, the set, the costumes, the light. I mean, endless. I mean, endless lighting tests and all of that. Um, very, very, very prepared. But he doesn't actually start um, dealing with the acting until you start shooting. So you shoot masses. And, and then you, you can do something. And a few days later, he says, are we going to do that again? Because I think this is a So we reshot quite a lot. Um, but once I started doing that sort of, um, you know, that I'd just go like that, and he'd say, oh, that's great. Let's push that a bit more. Let, let's go with that bit of her that's just very centered and very still. And, um, uh, and, and he did ask me to, I remember that shot looking right down the barrel. And he, I said, because normally they put a little cross on the side of the camera on the box surrounding it for you to, for you to look at. Um, I said, well, where do you want me to look? And he went, yeah, let's look right down the barrel. I thought, oh, that'd be interesting. OK, we'll, we'll do that. But, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's such a creative director. I had no idea what he was going to do with it in the cutting room. Um, and, of course, I ha was not prepared at all for Johnny Greenwood's epic score. Um, so it, you know, it became it became this thing, and then I thought, oh God, yeah, it's rather it, it's rather wonderful. It's it's hard to see it always when you're when you're in a film. You can't. I mean, I felt that with another year as well. I mean, interestingly, with another year, um, I, if any of you who saw it, the the film ends with this um, sort of lunch that they're all having, and there's quite a lot of them sitting around the table, and Mary, my character, is there, having sort of crashed, gate crashed it really. And we did this elaborate setup with a track going all the way around the exterior of the table. And this was also near the end of the shoot. And I, you know, we'd done the whole film, but you never know anything other th than what your character knows. So I didn't know what Jim Broadbent and Ruth Sheen had been doing, what they'd been up to when I wasn't there. So this track went round and round and round and round. And then I heard Mike talking to Dick Pope, the cinematographer, and he said, and then it will come round and it will end on Leslie. And I thought, why is it ending on me? And then it was then, I didn't say anything. I thought, well, fuck, maybe the film is about Mary. Or emotionally, the heart of the film is Mary. And that's the first I knew. And that was nearly the end of the shoot. And, and it, was that, it was only then that I, that I thought that I could see that um, if the film was going to end on a long, still, quiet shot of my face. I must be an important part it's of the film. your film. film. <laughs> it's your film. Listen, it's been the year of Leslie Manville, but it's also been the year of another actor who kind of arrived with this astonishing performance. Before I introduce her to the stage, let's have a look at at least a brief moment from that astonishing performance. This is from the film Lady Macbeth. Please welcome to the stage, Naomi Aki. <laughs> Um, we were talking earlier about drama school. We had a session here about drama schools and about people coming in. And I wondered for you, you know, this is quite a recent story for you, how you came in and how you, first of all, how you came in, how you got trained, and then how Lady Macbeth found you. Yeah, um, well, I went to Central um, and I did a course called CDT. So I, I, my origins was like making theatre. And it was like devising and directing and writing and all of that. Um, when I left, I went straight into theatre and I was just doing like kids tours and stuff like that for like the first three years. And this kind of popped out of nowhere. It was, um, it was a one audition kind of situation. I did one audition. Um, I thought it went awfully. I was like very in my feelings. Like I went and had a drink with my friends. I went shopping because I was just like, I'm just never going to be a film actress. <laughs> and then uh, three weeks later, I got the call to say I got it. So it was, it, it, it was just, it's, it's still to, like, it's one of those things I think, you know, like, okay, so you know, like, when, <laughs> when you imagine being an actor and then, like, you're walking down the street and the director is like, stop, right there. <laughs> <laughs> it's as close as I was going to get <laughs> to, like, the, oh, my God, she's going to be a star. 
<laughs> so um, yeah, it was it's amazing, and I, I, ever since, even while we were doing it, I I, I didn't anticipate uh, what that would do for everyone involved in the film. Like that's just been a huge leap off point for so many people. I mean, we were talking a little bit earlier about the differences between well, working in theatre, TV and film, but also breaking into them. And it feels like coming from a film background that theatre actually is more of an open place, actually. And actually, actually yeah, yeah. we're here, it's working class heroes. Coming from a working class background, it's actually, it's maybe easier to break in. So it's not easy, but you go from theatre into film. Whereas if you tried to get into Lady Macbeth in the first place, it would... Oh, no be, way. Right. No way, because I, I mean... To be honest, the reason, one of the main reasons why I went to drama school in the first place was because I didn't have any way of getting an agent, really, honestly. Like, I used to spend hours when I was a kid just trawling through agents and, like, trying to figure out which ones and researching. And I, 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 my, my parents were, like, public sector workers. My dad works for the underground. My mum worked for the NHS. Like, so I... I was like, okay, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna do this, I've got to go through the long way. I've got to, and mm -hmm. and, I, and in a way, like that kind of naive thing of going like, I just want to get there, was scuppered by the fact that I had to go to drama school, and then I did learn things, um, <laughs> and I got better. Um, but like that was that was uh, I had to take the long way around, and I think even there's something about patience with um, this job that I think you really have to take into account, especially when you're working class. And, and kind of going, okay, it might take a bit longer. Like, like you said earlier, it might mm. just take a bit longer for people to like get it. I wonder, I mean, one of the balancing acts that sort of has already come up a little bit today has been the idea of saying, actually there are, if you don't have connections, you don't have any money in your pocket, mm. it's hard. And we should be able to yeah, say yeah. that it's hard and, and it's harder. But at the same time, not just ending up complaining about things and also sort of celebrating ourselves and having confidence. Yeah. So how do we do that? How do, you, how do we pull I mean, that? I mean, the struggle is the good thing. I mean, okay, for instance, just before Christmas, I was working at Crystal Maze. I'm not even lying. I was the maze master who'd come in and be like, oh, welcome to the Crystal Maze. Like, I was that person. <laughs> so, like, I know. <laughs> I know. So, I, like, I just quit my job before Christmas. And that, that's crazy. Like, last year, the film came out. I got a biffa, Stars of Tomorrow, all of that great stuff, but I was still having to put on tie-dye leggings <laughs> and go to Crystal Maze, and it's like, that's okay. Yeah. Like, let's, let's get rid of this illusion that, like, actors are this kind of, like, separate entity that, like, mm. are born from the stars themselves. It's like, no, we've got crap to do. Like, we've got to get stuff done. And, like, I, I luckily, I've quit. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not doing that anymore. Um, but that, to me, is character building. I think that's probably one of the reasons why I think working class actors are so um, versatile, because we have to encompass all the worlds, the fancy stuff, like the Oscars and all of that stuff, but also like the nitty gritty getting, you know. Does it feel, I mean, it might just be a bit of a mad theory, but also, I mean, it feels like a lot of working class actors can act up quite happily, like, you know, you go all the way yeah, back yeah. to Michael Caine playing officers, actually people can do that, and my pet theory but tell me if you think I'm mm. mad is that actually if you grow up working class you have to sort of you have to learn the different codes and you have to sort of oh, learn when to use a different accent so when you were in high hopes Leslie I was thinking that's an accent we have to sort of posh up now mm. and again yeah right? is that definitely yeah. I do it all the time yeah. <laughs> I, I was at um the pre pre BAFTA party thing and I entered the space and I was like I could just smell the money and I just like, all of a sudden I was just like I was just like it's so nice to meet you like and I was talking like this and like everything was like so like hi you know like my name's Amy and, like I was just like what are you doing now like that's not that's not you but like I think we are so used to that like having to pretend to 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 be some like, outside of the acting I think just working class people to, to get by, to get stuff done, to be listened to. Does that ever change, Leslie? I wonder when you mentioned, and he's a wonderful actor, so I don't want to pick on him, but when you mentioned Jeremy Irons, I've met Jeremy Irons, he is very, of a certain breathing. I mean, do, do, you, do we ever get to a stage <laughs> where you don't clock that straight away? Well, you, 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 you don't with Jeremy, no. Um, <laughs> and that's not a negative. I mean, he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a public school educated boy, and that's what, that's what right, he is, and right. he, that's what he does. Um, well, I don't... 
Do we ever get to the stage where we don't clock it immediately? Yeah, I mean, I suppose maybe this is just... I mean, it's interesting when I talk to people who aren't from Britain because they don't quite... They don't see it in quite the same way. They don't register. That's but when right. We, when we see That's each other, right, yeah. it's, like the f it's almost like the first yeah. thing we see. Yeah. You know? yeah. Well, I don't know because you... I don't, I don't know anymore because, I mean, obviously my back, my roots were working class, but you know, I I, I don't have a I don't have a working class lifestyle yeah. now, and so you you wonder how wh wh what people can read from you. I don't know. I can't best answer that, or how I feel about other people. I mm. I think I I think I've been telling myself lately to stop making judgments so quickly not judgments but you know oh you're oh you're that are you oh you're that i've been trying to because you can't tell you can can't. you i don't you think can't. you can tell anymore i wanted to pick up because obviously you've, yeah. you've both been award winners now you mentioned that the oscar nomination just completely transformed things which is crazy because the idea that it took that yes but the, i would have thought from the outside again so the, the yeah. biffa best newcomer yeah. again non-actor i think oh well, that's going to change your life yeah. but maybe not i don't know but, um, <laughs> It changed from, I think it, what it did, and what I kind of cling on to, especially in the moments where I feel like I'm ready to quit because I've had just about enough, which was like last year, because last year I was like, I don't know if I can even afford to be an actor anymore, because it's quite a, when you're, when you're starting out, it's quite expensive H to how do. How old, do you mind me asking? I don't know, I'm 26. Right. Yeah, 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 I'm 26, and like, I, I left drama school when I was 20. So like, the, the, what's the question? <laughs> <laughs> I, I wondered if the, if the award had yeah had it changed okay me. yeah so so what it did for me in terms of that feeling of panic that that you tend to get as a freelancer is when I walked into the rooms audition rooms I I felt for me I was kind of I had a bit more of a solid spine because of it um I, I think also like you know the directors now are just like, oh, she's got a little title or something. So, yeah. they, they, and it helps. Right. Like, and but I think also that I think another thing that's important is that there is, I think, for young people starting now, there's this pressure that it's all got to come together very quickly. Yeah. And when I started, um, nobody ever dreamed of making films or going to America. It mm. just didn't happen. Mm. I mean, Gary Oldman was one of the first people for that to happen to. Mm. It, it, and it wasn't on the radar at all. So you just did the work. You just did that <coughs> theatre job, this, this bit of a telly, this maybe a bit of a film here. But it, it was all about doing the work. And I think there's so much now that's about young people being, you know, are you on social media? Are you this? Are you that? And where are you going? Are you, are you in this magazine and that? And publicists? And then you think, no, get rid of all that. It's nonsense. It's, it's only about the work. It's true. I do. I mean, I've, I've had actor friends who've said to me, oh, well, the apart went to somebody else because they've got more Twitter followers. Oh, no, that's a real thing now. That's a real thing. Like, I, I had a mate who, who didn't get a part. Director loved the uh, producers, but the big wigs were like, no, nah, she ain't got enough Instagram followers. That's like a real thing. Is and this, that's is this news to you, Lord? Do, you, do people around that? Oh, wow. That's, it's mad. And Pardon? music. Yeah, it's, cra it's, 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 it's crazy, and it messes. And it does I think mess it's harder head. now. I mean, I'm, I, I'm glad I was doing it in the time I was doing it because mm. that's all it was about the work. Yeah, not not about um, this, you know, awful self promotion that it you're is. supposed to I, do. I, and I, like, I am not. I definitely can drift in and have to remind myself why I started doing this because you can. I think you, you're of two minds. You know, you're an artist, but you're also business person you need to make mm. money out of this thing that you love to create and the conflict really messes with you and I have to remind myself like nay you're an actress you're not like a, a spokesman. You also, like. you also have to think how long do I want to be doing my like job for, for it, and obviously yeah. you want to do it f forever yeah. and so you have to sow the seeds for the long journey exactly and 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 mm. you know the front of Hello magazine is not sowing the seeds for the long journey. Absolutely. It just isn't. Absolutely. It's taking your time. And I think ultimately the the staying grounded is like my big thing at the moment. Because it's like, like, like you said, like after the biffers and stuff like that, there was a lot of like stuff. There was just all the stuff, which is, can be quite exciting and fancy. But also it's like, wait, 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 okay. What's actually real here? Hmm. What is real? Because you go and into you these might, spaces. You might have to go and do other jobs you yeah know? I mean I did other jobs lots of the time for quite some time yeah 
and it's just way yeah. way beyond my 20s because you know you you especially are, in fact interestingly just after Phil and I did grown ups when I thought right I'm not going to go back and do the sort of things I'd been doing I wanted to sort of head off on this new path and I really didn't work for a year mm. so I was I was like you've, got to, you've got to go and make some money yeah so. it's, it's true and that's okay I of think course like, it's okay that's, uh, the thing is like there's a thing I think in in our new way of living that we all kind of live the lie like knowing that everyone's kind of lying like with Instagram and stuff like that, it's like my life is so amazing, and then it's just like now you know you're just sat in your like pajamas in your living room, and you took that photo like last year, and you're just like bringing it up. That's what Throwback Thursday is like all about. So, like that, that is I think that's the real trick now is to go okay, like as performers or whatever you're doing is like what is real, what is not. Investing the stuff that's real, the creativity is the real part. That's the joy is being on set, being on stage, working on material. Everything after that just disappears. Like, all those fancy stuff, I take my lashes off and the fake hair out and stuff, and then I'm just like, back to being just nay, isn't it? And it's like... Before I throw it open, I mean, the other thing, we talked a little bit about it just before, is for both of you, you're in this position now, nice problem to have, but where you go as an actor from trying to pay the gas bill to actually having to be quite careful about what you say yes and no to, and I wonder how often you have to say no to things and when you choose yeah. to make that. You know, it's like a gamble. The thing, the, the project that you say no to, you don't want to be involved in, what if that goes off and becomes a... Mm. I recently had... Oh, sorry, that's a bit loud. I recently had to um, say no to a film. The first time I've... Um... Sorry. <laughs> I didn't know that was going to be so noisy. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I recently had to say no to a film, which is something I never thought I would have to do. I think for, uh, for me, what I, what, the way I think about mm, where I want my career to go is that it's like a, if I, if my career is like a gallery, then I'm like the, the curator. I want, I want my work to make sense to my integrity and to my thoughts about who I am but also what the world is and I don't want anything to interfere with that. I think that's my responsibility of like what I want to put out in the world. So this film <coughs> conflicted with that and it, it's mad to me like even though the, you know financially it would have been great I had to go okay I'm just gonna like push it away and and trust that the right things will come to me and I think like you mm. said like it's power to it's one of the only powers we have is to be able to say, to say yes or no yeah. yeah 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 well I mean how for you Leslie I mean how that, that first time that you say no to something how scary does that feel well it it, it does but you know it, it, if you like it's like Naomi says if you've got that kind of um uh uh what's the word um standard for mm. yourself you don't, you don't, you don't want to break it. But then, at the same time, there are dilemmas because you do have bills to pay. And um, when I, um, it's been written, it's gone and ended up in the press quite a bit. But um, the, when I finished Phantom Thread, and and Daniel, I said to Daniel, I was going off to do series two of Mum within about two weeks. He said, No, how can you do that? How? How can you do that with only two weeks off? He said, well, you know, I've got to pay the electricity bill. Mm. Of course, that's become a big thing now. I have to pay the electricity bill. Mm -hmm. But it's sort of true, and you want, but also you want to keep going. Um, but you do have to, you, you are going to have to say no to things because they don't fall in with, with, with your own projection. And yeah. you may have agents and people in your life that help you with your career. But at the end of the day, it all the buck sits with... Naomi and I as to where we take ourselves and what we do and those choices and you, you have to kind of be your own standard bearer. Yeah. I'm really sorry I've monopolised the conversation because I'm so starstruck um, but I now, <laughs> want to, I now want to open it up so if you have questions. Uh, my accent is probably uh, was probably more RP when I was younger. Ah. I, 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 I grew up in uh, an area um, I grew up in Hove uh, but we were working class. My father was a bookmaker and a taxi driver and a plumber. He was a bit of a jack of all trades, and we lived in a council flat. But I have always spoken like this. I mean, Peter will vouch for that. I've always sounded like this. Right. Um, I went to a, a nice, comprehensive school. I mean, we didn't live in a, a rough area. Mm. We, we, we had money. We had enough money, but we didn't have too much money. But I, ha I have nothing... Uh, 
in fact, I'm probably m more London sounding now than I was when I was a little girl. No, I, I was a very, very, very good girl. And yeah. that whole <laughs> thing about being polite and right. um, well spoken was um, was just part of of my upbringing. And okay. my sisters are the same. Th th their accents don't betray uh, their class. So uh, I'm, it, nothing was knocked out of me at all. Excellent. Okay. Well, well mini crisis points. Um, uh, but but I never doubted that it would come right in the end. And it was mostly with what I referred to just now. That, I think that was the worst point. But I knew I had this little nugget of a film to come out on the BBC, and that I, I hoped that it would, it would, um, you know, help me, and it did. But I had to kind of take the bull by the horns and knuckle down and um, look after myself for the year that when I really didn't work at all. Um, but it's all good stuff, you know. Our, our jobs as actors, it really is to, uh, you know, view the world around you the pe and, and the people in it and to relay that, whether it's people who are struggling or not struggling. Or you, so you mustn't ever, I, I think the whole thing of doing other jobs and do, I mean, people get amazed sometimes when I say, well, I'm just going to get the bus and going to, you're going to get the bus. Yeah. Why wouldn't I get the bus? Oh, yeah. I, I don't get it. Mm -hmm. What do they think I'm going to do just because I've made a film with Daniel Day-Lewis? I'm going to have a chauffeur. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. But I wouldn't want that kind of life anyway because... Um, boring. It's boring, yeah. yeah. You don't... In, you're not... You are separating yourself from the world that you're then trying to depict. Yeah. I was just going to say because yeah. surely because actors, one of the things that great actors have in common is they're like people watchers, and you're always it's all it's all material. So if you're sitting off, well, I um, mean that's very much the uh, my, uh, that's very ingrained in me because of Mike Lee, you know, because yeah. that's all about people watching and then bringing them to the room and and doing them, and then they become Mary or whoever. Mm. Um, so yeah, but I, I I can't do that. It's not in my it's not in my bones, so I suppose, in a way, or I may, I may have an RP accent that I've always had, but I, I, that's the working class bit of me, if you like, mm -hmm. that I, 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 I don't ever want to be that separate from the world that you think I'm not going to get on a bus. Mm. That would be a danger zone oh, for me. No, no. You can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's my two pence worth. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> We're out of time. Um, please join me in celebrating the year of Leslie Randall. The year of Naomi Ackie. <laughs> <laughs>